The preservation of the developmental biology film series was made possible by generous contributions from Distinguished University Professor of Geosciences, Lynn Margulis Terence Malick Chelsea Green Publishing The Politics and Practice of Sustainable Living The Hardy Lane Foundation the International Symbiosis Society. Geobook Studio, publisher of The Biggest Picture. Hummingbird Films, producer of the documentary Symbiotic Earth. And supporters of the Lynn Margulis Archive at ScholarWorks. The trematodes, or flukes, are an important group of animal parasites belonging to the phylum Platyhelminthes. Many of these flatworms have elaborate life histories with several morphologically distinct larval forms living in different intermediate hosts. The adult worms live in the gut of a seagull. Their eggs, already developing, pass in the feces of the gull onto the rocks and seaweed of the seashore. A marine snail, the common periwinkle, eats the developing eggs and becomes the second host of the parasite. The snail houses in succession no less than four distinct larval types, two of which are designed to produce the vast population explosion which is so vital to the continued existence of most internal parasites. First, the myricidium, which hatches out in the snail, metamorphoses into a second larval type, the sporocyst, which is little more than a bag of germinal cells. These germinal cells develop, by a process of polyembryony, into individuals of a third larval type, the redia. The redia is similar to the sporocyst, and in its turn produces a large number of larvae of a fourth type, the cercaria. These larvae are active swimmers and escape from the snail in swarms. On meeting cunnerfish, they bore into the skin and form cysts in the tissues of the host. When an infected fish is eaten by a seagull, the parasitic cycle starts all over again with the adult flatworms in the gut of the primary host. In this group of adult flukes, Isolated from the intestine of a gull, and here seen under the microscope, the smaller colourless specimens are younger forms which have but recently developed. The others are sexually mature adults in varying stages of readiness for egg laying. Many features are identifiable in the living worm. At the front end of the flat, leaf-like body is a sucker used by the parasite for clinging to the intestinal wall of the host. The mouth opens in the center of the sucker, and immediately behind it is a muscular pharynx which connects the mouth to the gut. Just behind the pharynx, the gut divides into two branches, which run laterally down the body and end blindly at the rear. Two testes lie in the rear, and adjacent to them the seminal receptacle, an organ used for sperm storage. Near this there is an elongate ovary where the eggs are produced. The dark lateral masses are vitelline cells which secrete yolk. Since both testes and ovary are present in the same individual, the adult is a functional hermaphrodite. Nevertheless, cross-fertilization is probably the rule. 
Sperm exchanged through opposing genital pores during copulation are stored in the seminal receptacles. As eggs are released from the ovary, they are fertilized by sperm from the receptacle, previously contributed by another worm. Fertilized eggs pass down a long coiled uterus where they acquire yolk and a shell. The eggs, which are about one twentieth of a millimeter in length, accumulate in the uterus and there begin development before they are discharged through the genital pore. As the worm is here slightly flattened on a glass microscope slide, it is difficult to see that the eggs have in fact passed out of the pore. Under natural conditions, of course, they would be swept from the host in the feces and scattered on the rocks and algae on the seashore. When voided by the host, the eggs are in late cleavage stages. Several days are required for an embryo to develop within each egg into the first stage larva, the myricidium. Though it does not escape at this point, the larva can be seen to move within the eggshell. The myricidium does not hatch until it has been eaten by the first intermediate host, the common seashore snail, Litterina litterea. The ingestion of the unhatched myricidium is a completely random event which happens as the snails browse on the algae covering the rocks of the intertidal zone. Infected snails can be distinguished by the yellowish color of the foot. In a healthy, uninfected snail, the foot is white. The myricidia, which hatch out in the gut of the snail, penetrate the tissues where they promptly metamorphose into larvae of the second type, sporocysts. These have only been found in very young snails. The sporocyst is little more than a thin-walled bag of germinal cells. These germinal cells undergo polyembryonic development into a third type of larva, the redia, many of which are released into the tissues of the snail host by rupture of the sporocyst. The redia is a sausage-like sac similar to the sporocyst, except that it has an oral sucker with a mouth leading to a rudimentary gut. As in the sporocyst, the young redia contains a cluster of germ cells which again by the asexual process of polyembryony are capable of giving rise to a large and continuing supply of new embryos. The front end of a mature redia becomes completely filled with larvae of the fourth type, Cercarii. The Cercarii escape from the redia by way of a birth pore located near the mouth at the front end of the redia. On emerging from the redia, the cercaria is already equipped with two dark eye spots and it has the general form of a fully developed larva. As they migrate through the body of the snail to the periphery of the digestive gland, the cercarii continue to develop and differentiate. This is a fully developed cercaria. It has a sucker and a mouth at the front end, and its tail has developed a fin. The sucker is for temporary attachment to the skin of the host fish. The two eye spots are prominent. At the back of the body, 
is an excretory vesicle. But most important of all are the penetration glands. Their function is to soften the skin and tissues of the fish, enabling the parasite more easily to gain an entry. Other glands are present which can secrete material on the surface of the larva, which results in the formation of a cyst for protecting the parasite once it is lodged in the tissues of the fish host. The fully developed cercaria is now ready and equipped for the next step in the life cycle, transfer to the second intermediate host. Unlike the previous larval forms, which are nothing more than reproductive machines designed for a massive multiplication of numbers, the free-swimming cercaria is an active organism and makes the change from one host to the next by its own unaided efforts. After escape from the snail, the cercarii swim actively in the sea until they encounter the somewhat sluggish cunnerfish. The parasites may attack any part of the fish and large numbers enter the fins where they can be seen most easily. Attachment to the skin is achieved by means of the sucker. Soon after attachment, the larva loses its tail, which has now served its purpose like a burned out rocket booster. The enzymes secreted by the penetration glands now come into play, dissolving the tissues of the host as the parasites bore their way in. After penetration of the skin, the parasites generally migrate through the tissues of the fish, often quite rapidly, until they reach a suitable place for insistment. Insistment is achieved with the help of the cystogenous gland cells covering the body surface. These secrete a wall around the parasite, now called a metacercaria. Though the cyst enlarges somewhat as it ages, the metacercaria itself grows faster and eventually becomes doubled up within the capsule. It is easy to see when a cunner is infected. All parts of the body and fins are covered with the dark spots of the insisted parasites. Transfer of the metacercaria from the fish to the main host, the seagull, is once more a passive procedure, at least from the standpoint of the parasite. All it has to do is to wait around until the fish is eaten by a gull. In practice, it is found that the immature gulls of the first season are more heavily parasitized than the adult gulls. In their intestines, apparently, occur conditions most favorable for the development and growth of the adult flukes. And so this strange story comes full cycle. A story of intricate morphogenetic change ensuring the survival of the species.